You're listening to The Art of Procurement, episode 138. And The Art of Procurement is powered by Palambridge, the strategic procurement on-demand business that I co-founded earlier this year. And we actually just launched the Palambridge Sourcing Power Pack. It's an easy, low-risk way to test drive the Palambridge model while accessing the subject matter expertise you need when you need it to really turbocharge the results of your next sourcing project. So to learn more, just check us out. It's at palambridge.com. Welcome to the Art of Procurement Podcast with your host, Philip Eitzen. Here, thought leaders share the trends, strategies, and tactics that you can use to elevate the role of procurement and your career. So hi there, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Art of Procurement this week. And my name is Philip Eitzen. I'm the host of the show. And we're really in for a treat this week. I'm joined by Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple the inventor of the personal computer, a serial entrepreneur, and lots, lots more in between. Obviously, Steve really needs no introduction. And I was thrilled to be able to welcome Woz onto the show. And I want to thank Cooper for making this happen. So Steve recently keynoted the Cooper Inspire Conference in San Francisco. I attended that a couple of weeks ago. And Cooper arranged for Steve to spend 15 minutes with me after he got off stage. And so fresh off his inspirational fireside chat, we actually sat down and I recorded the conversation for the podcast. And as I considered in advance kind of what questions I should ask to maximize our 15 minutes together, I focused on areas that have been a key part of Wazzy's experiences as an innovator. And then from his first hand experience building the Apple brand itself with Steve Jobs. And I'll be following up with a series of blog posts where I share some of my key takeaways from my conversation and how I think we can apply them in procurement specifically. Um, Those are going to be linked to from the show notes for today's episode, and those will be at artofprocurement.com slash was. That's artofprocurement.com slash was. All right, well, with that being said, let's roll the tape on our conversation. Okay, well, hi there, everybody, and welcome to today's Art of Procurement, and I'm truly honored to be joined on the show today by Steve Wozniak. So, Steve, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, I'm delighted you could join me. Yeah. Um, you talked just in the keynote um, that I attended about innovation. I wanted to touch on, first of all, something really interesting to me. You said it was because you, were, you felt you were shy that that was one of the things that helped you innovate. You know, where do you think innovation does come from? Is it something that comes from within, or is it something that can be trained? You know, it's like Steve Jobs said in his graduation speech at Stanford, connecting the dots, you can connect them backwards, you can't connect them forwards. Mm -hmm. Um, Did I sit down and say, what can I do when I was young to make myself innovative? No. Right. It was lucky accidents the way I stumbled into things, things that made me laugh and smile and get praise from from teachers and from parents and things like that. I don't know, so I can't really explain. Of course, Mm -hmm. I can think of a lot of the experiences I had that meant a lot to me inside. So inside, you remember them to this day. I don't remember chemistry equations from high school, but I sure (laughs) remember certain fun things. And, um, you know, from TV shows I watched to movies to talking with other friends to having half the kids in our neighborhood were had like engineers for parents. Mm-hmm. And engineers create things that didn't exist, and that's, that's part of that yeah. little, that innovative in- inspiration. As a company, how do you think that a company can kind of encourage or inspire its people to come up with innovative and creative ideas? Yeah, there are different management techniques, but see, I can't change them, but what I, why, what I say. Um, there are lots of people that study it, the universities mm-hmm. and in business and find out what works and what doesn't. Yeah. Sometimes you luck into the right situation. Right. I think a lot of times it's because the personalities mesh just the right way, right. but the lower, the more responsibility you can give the people lower down, mm-hmm. right to the person working on a project to make changes to it on the fly, right. real quick expedient stuff and not have to get every little change approved by every management level up above. And then you got to make sure you hire good people to mm-hmm. do that and, and hire innovators 
um, at least some of your team should be innovators. Yeah. Some can be capable builders, you know, just giving me a task and I do it. Right. But the innovators are the types of people that grew up their whole life as makers. Yeah. They would take little ideas and turn them into, into stuff that wasn't worth money maybe, but mm -hmm. little robots or right. software projects. and That desire to kind of ex yeah. experiment, I guess. And when I worked at Hewlett Packard, I admired it so much. They put the highest level of decision making at the lowest level of management possible. Right. So a lot of things could get done very quickly with mm -hmm. just a single supervisor's approval. So speed is, is, really, is really important and doing things iteratively by the sound of it as well. It's not necessarily waiting for somebody to go and build something and it takes them six months or 12 months. It's changing it along the way and giving people permission to change along the way. Yeah, one thing is don't expect greatness or don't yeah. expect real success from your designs if you're not willing to put in a lot of work, a lot of hours, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, some people just give up on that and that's going to that, that's going to keep you from the greatness that's better than other people. Right. And, and that's competition. That's what, what our whole business, you know, is based on. Right. You know, a lot of innovation within, um, certainly from as, as, as procurement professionals that we work with is partnering, partnering with third parties to bring innovation in. And that can obviously be something that, you know, there's two, maybe two different, I know, motivators for doing that on an internal perspective versus an external, which is to profit out of it. How... What are some tips perhaps you can provide in, in how you can partner with a third party to really drive innovation forward, you know, while having kind of a common goal, I guess? Well, I was the sort of engineer that would encourage to have innovation within your company mm -hmm. as well. Once a company gets pretty big, it's like, oh my gosh, I can just buy the steps, the little steps I need to be uh, equal to the competitors. And that's not like you did it yourself. You just spotted, you know, who you can acquire. Right. Um, obviously, communication is very important. Mm -hmm. Do you really... Um, um, share what you're about and where you're going yeah. and to try to keep that partnership give the the company that's say being acquired by a larger company the smaller yeah. bit give them an awful lot of autonomy mm -hmm. but actually listen to them and go in their way give them some some say in even your right. own direction your company yeah. obviously a board seat is a starting point but as much as they want um, the, the more you have the better and uh, both parties should both parties should say I want to be loyal yeah. and what I do in the future is really not only for me, but it's also mm -hmm. for this my partner. Right. And the, similarly, and that means that means maybe a big company has to say, what are the goals for our future? Share your roadmap yeah. and work it in, and uh, have the other company involved in coming up even with the roadmap. Don't you know? Don't treat yourself as well, two very distinct entities. Yeah. Merge it a bit. That's Merge it a bit. Have a good crossover area. And the transparency that you talked about that so often is difficult for us because we're in our own little silos and we don't really think about the bigger picture. We just try and keep things within our own world, but actually be open to sharing information. Yeah, sharing information is important, but probably also still keep good NDAs right. in place. It isn't really helpful if, if the whole world knows what you're doing while <laughs> right. you're doing it. Right. Um, no, and there's more and more of, like, you see it in the news more and more when that's happening. So. Um, Procurement, you know, as most business functions, we run at a kind of a crossroads. We need to disrupt our own business model um, by embracing technology. There's RPA, AI. Um, before some of those disruptions impact us from the outside, you know, we need to be in control of that disruption. And to lead that change requires an entrepreneurial mindset. I wonder if you could give some advice on how, if you're in a big company, you can kind of think and act like an entrepreneur. Yeah, well, let's say it is procurement. I mean, you can obviously, it's kind of like getting up into the big data areas mm -hmm. where you're trying to analyze all the different um, levels of procurement for a big company, what yeah. they're getting, and where can we make differences. Right. One at a time is not the efficient way to do it. You mm -hmm. wind up at the end of your limits of, well, we'll put all this, this kind of screw and this kind of nut and this kind of bolt and this kind of chip and this kind of, kind of um, computer. Oh my gosh, each one independently is yeah. a huge task. Yeah. So a machine that can learn its way and find out what works the best. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, maybe by studying economic results of other companies using different procurement systems might be the best way to do it. As far as um, innovation, it's really a matter of like letting things, things go and trying them out. Right. Artificial intelligence you mentioned, um, that's, uh, I mean, learning machines, we're not really at true intelligence right. yet. But learning machines that can study patterns and find out, you know, a lot of spot, a lot of correlations and, and give advice, I think is a real good thing to get into. You, that means hiring some real right. experts in it, you know, real experts in the field. Do you think we need to fear things like AI or whether it will actually help us do what we do, but only better, you know, make us more efficient? Fearing it's only going to keep you held back from um, 
the good things you can do in the world and it's going to give you fears and mm -hmm. that's not worth it. No, I think right. that all the artificial intelligence we're working on is only under concepts of if we have if we have artificial machines, we as humans can have a goal and it can do more. Yeah. We've never talked about it making up its own goals right. that might not even be coincide with ours. That's, mm -hmm. We're not, you know, that couldn't happen for decades at least. You, you know, you, you talk a lot about education and you're passionate about education and, you know, as technology develops, that will naturally just take some jobs away. It will provide opportunities in other fields and without going into what the fields that will be impacted and not impacted, I'm more interested in kind of what the listeners can do generally t to remain relevant and to really focus on the jobs that are going to be important mm -hmm. as technology kind of takes some more of those transactional and tactical roles away. To me, that's more of a psychological question mm -hmm. than an economic one. And how, how do people deal with change? You know what? They, they don't have to. The older right. generation says, I lost something that was really good in my life that I cared about that meant a lot. And where did it go? The younger people don't have it. I mean, they just have instant answers. They don't have to do the thinking. The things that gave me pleasure went away, but they never notice it. The newer, mm -hmm. the newer groups just come in. I'm working out in today's environment, and I'm finding my ways to happiness and innovation and achievement, and all jobs going away. It's funny. We've had this personal computer revolution. We've had Moore's law go a billion right. times, and and where the where's the low employment? You know, right. especially in the United States, it's been right. one of the leaders of it. Mm -hmm. No, especially in Silicon Valley. Huge, um, huge employment. So for some reason, those jobs that you can imagine going away never quite go away. Right. Maybe they get redefined a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of like, um, oh, what's the example I'm thinking of? Chips. Yep. They made chips that were more and more powerful processors. Yep. You had enough of a processor. Oh my gosh, it's kind of like everything's on one chip. That means all the things that the chips that's made of it just goes away. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is the chip companies will tell you, no, no, no. There's always new little ideas that come in and, and new types of technologies mm -hmm. and other types of chips. And, and it's for some reason the chip industry never goes down because like right. we've done it all, you know, there's, there's nothing left to be invented. <laughs> there's always something new that you never even thought about before that becomes yeah. possible because of developments sure. that proceed. And it. look at the current times. We have yeah. so much going on in areas of internet of things, mm -hmm. uh, virtual reality, or augmented reality, artificial intelligence, so many different things, self-driving cars, electric cars. Oh, technology is just, uh, it's hard to see how it can stop from growing. Right. You know, you talked about a lot of different things in terms of new technologies. Is there anything that you're, you know, you think will be more impactful than, than something else? Where would your money be in terms of the impact that all these technologies are going to make? Well, I think the biggest money is going to go to the biggest thing we spend on. Mm -hmm. Might be homes that are made out of 3D eventually, right. but right now it's the, the automobile. You know, you, everybody has an automobile, everybody yeah. has a computer or a smartphone. Which yeah. one costs more? Right. And you'll see the economic size difference. Mm -hmm. So the biggest companies of the world really have to kind of hit into automotives and do we replace owning cars and all this stuff. We've given up ownership a lot with our stuff online with, yeah. with the cloud. Yeah. So does that continue? Um, I'm not. I'm not like a uh, a little quiet panel of brain, you know, brainstorming mm -hmm. to think out where it goes. But the, the economics and the economics touch a huge amount of, uh, like, car insurance is a big industry. Yeah. Well, if the accidents get cut by ten, right. that means the insurance industry shrinks by ten. Yeah. So you have to think out new angles on on everything. Where can we? I am so hopeful that something like that happens that we get an awful lot more for less people doing it because then we can finally have more people maybe working in the health business right. and bring health costs down. Yeah, kind of focusing on the real, I don't know, humanitarian challenges that we still have as opposed to, you know, some of the, the more, I guess, business Yes, centric. and the more productive we are, mm -hmm. the more room we have for those humanitarian challenges. Well said on your part. Right, thank you. Well, I think it's fair to say when you look back at the success of Apple, you know, a lot of it is down to reputation, brand loyalty. I wonder if you could share, like, what can we as business, as folks in business um, departments, we struggle mm -hmm. with, I don't know, getting people within our, even our organizations to, to think of us as, as to having a good reputation and be too loyal to come and use us as a business function. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things or philosophies that you think that dry, drove that brand loyalty for Apple that maybe we can learn from in, in how we go about doing our business? Yeah, I'm not sure you can really learn from another's example mm -hmm. in this area. Brand is so difficult. Everybody wishes they had Apple brand, you know. Right. Um, 
there, there were times though, I think more than anything else, it was even though Steve Jobs had a failure with the Macintosh, yeah. business-wise, the, the, the whole message that we were doing something so different than has ever been done before and gonna change the world, and I think that was in Apple even before that. Right. That it was a huge company started by two young kids and just trying to do good things for people. Mm -hmm. So where did Apple's brand loyalty come from? Well, one thing is they got, after getting a good reputation, we had to rebuild our brand, if you right. remember, right. and Steve Jobs returned. Yeah by making very good products over and over and over mm -hmm. that don't disappoint users about the user experience. Right. So I say even a person using like B2B software, it should be so natural that they don't even feel that they're inside of a computer system they have to learn. Yeah. No learning is the best the right. best way to build stuff. And then I feel like I'm a person who thinks. Now, my recommendation more than anything else is speech. Recognize yeah. speech. Mm -hmm. Person has an idea and a thought, don't put them through structure. Right. I have to go here and tap this and I have to answer this question, I have to do this. Just speak what I want. And as general as it is, machines that can start to figure out very complicated meanings yeah. of sentences, we're getting closer and closer on that. I think that's one of the best cues of all for, um, for that user interface that just just, I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of being consistent, delivering on what you promise, and um, and doing it over time. Mm -hmm. And then over time, that kind of builds yes. a following and builds and people to have trust in what you say. Also, whatever you're doing, mm -hmm. don't necessarily try to do it first. A lot right. of people think, who the first comer gets the brand, yeah. you know, and Silicon Valley got branded because the inventor of the transistor moved there, you mm -hmm. know, and everything's based on transistors to this day. Um, so don't try to necessarily be first, but do things right. Make right. it, whatever you do, make it high quality. Yeah. There were smartphones around before the iPhone. Yeah. And be different. Don't be afraid to be different if you right. can see advantages to it. The iPhone was all one screen. No mm -hmm. buttons, no push, no typewriter, keyboard. And yeah, that was striking before, right? enough. I think it had to be secret. Yeah. If it hadn't been so yeah. secret when it was introduced, it wouldn't have had the same effect. And, and then look what it, what it did to the world. It didn't do the, the change didn't happen right away either. Right. The brand of Apple, um, I think, was still well established before that. Yeah. You know, yeah. and one of the young guys returning to the company, you can't put you can't put a formula no. on brand. It's one like of the things. X factor. However, if you're going to do something, try to be like the first to do it the right way. Mm -hmm. I I think, for example, self driving cars. Everybody's taking little steps, little steps, little steps. What if one company finally came out? Here's a car you can buy mm -hmm. today, and it has no steering wheel, and it's totally approved, and it works better than the right. others. What if one company did that? That would be like the astounding move Apple should be famous for. Right. It's like at that point, you keep kind of keeping under wraps. No matter how many, new no matter how many people follow behind you, if you yeah. got the good reputation, yeah. you're the one changing the industry right. to to no wheel. And it's not easy to do. Is the problem. Right. <laughs> Well, Steve, I know that um, we've got to wrap up. Uh, we're running out of time here, but I just want to thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. And I uh, really um, enjoyed the speech, the keynote that we did earlier, and um, it was fantastic to meet you. Well, so thanks. Th thanks for having me. I'm always glad to hear people enjoying it. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Art of Procurement. To find an archive of all past episodes, you can go to artofprocurement.com slash episodes. And to ensure you never miss another show, go to artofprocurement.com slash subscribe.